Welcome back to another Infinidem.org training presentation for the Boeing 777. Today we're going to have a quick look at some of the issues that present with a slats drive malfunction. For the flaps drive event there is a separate training presentation on the website. A quick word on terminology here. This is a slats drive malfunction. The slats themselves are leading edge high left flight control surfaces that are part of the flaps aircraft systems. Selected through the flap lever, controlled by the flaps slats electronic unit, and in some circumstances extended or retracted by the alternate flaps system. Clearly the confusion between slats and flaps gets rife here. I've been very careful to use the correct word in all instances, but you may have to listen or read a couple of times to clearly understand what I'm saying. For example, when I'm discussing a requirement to retract the flaps after a takeoff with a slats drive malfunction. Buyer beware. So as you may have guessed, this presentation looks at a slats drive failure, covering the essentials of the non-normal checklist as well as some of the operational impact of the failure as observed in the simulator. Slats drive is a caution level message and denotes the total loss of the leading edge high lift flight control services, the slats. Typically the flap slats electronic unit detects either an uncommanded motion or a lack of response to a command to move, usually involving some kind of slat asymmetry, and locks the system out. According to the FCOM, the FSAU can revert to the secondary system, that would be SLATS primary, in an attempt to move a SLAT prior to issuing a SLATS drive failure in response to a failed SLAT. With the SLATS drive malfunction comes the expanded flap indication. We can see the failed services in amber, the actual flap position in white, and the commanded flap position, green when flap selection is satisfied, and magenta when the flaps are not in the selected position. Assuming you manage to get them out during taxi, then the first time you're likely to encounter a slats drive malfunction is during flap retraction after takeoff, or at least that's when we tend to throw it at you in the simulator. In almost all situations, an ICAS alert message during takeoff is announced, but unless there are checklist memory items required, the failure is dealt with once the aircraft is out of the critical takeoff stage of flight. This usually means waiting until the aircraft is clean, climb or contrast is set, and the airplane's flight path in respect to MSA and navigation, SID or otherwise, has been dealt with. The normal checklist, the after takeoff checklist, should be held until any outstanding non-normal checklists are complete. That's the standard model. However, Technically, with a slats drive malfunction, such as we have here, you do have the option of retracting the flaps prior to running the slats drive checklist. And look, that would seem to be in keeping with the non-normal paradigm we use on takeoff. And unlike the flaps drive failure, in this case with slats drive, retracting the actual flaps will make a significant difference to the drag on the airframe and the limiting airspeed you're forced to deal with on the aircraft. However, again, while in practice this does work, there is a good argument for delaying both the non-normal checklist and any further flap retraction until a safe height is reached, then running the non-normal slats drive checklist before deciding whether to further retract flaps. With either the flaps drive or slats drive failures, the aircraft isn't going anywhere far, and it's a highly unusual situation that would require an extensive diversion at this point. The use of alternate flaps will almost certainly exacerbate any asymmetry that may have developed, or have been prevented by the slats drive malfunction. However, normal flaps are available, as evidenced by the checklist note advising use flaps 20 for landing. It's true that the FMC can be modified to account for low altitudes and slower speeds, sort of, to approximate fuel usage with partial flight control extension. But the increased drag and fuel flow associated with the flight control service extension cannot be accounted for. While some performance information exists in the QRH to give an idea of fuel flow increase, so for example holding with flaps 1, there's data for that, there is otherwise no information available. If you have to divert from your departure airfield uh, to a takeoff alternate, for example, where fuel usage is going to be an issue, then you're back to first principles. Be conservative, assess your fuel flow, your TAS, your ground speed en route, etc. Update and constantly recheck and cross check your calculations. So, that in mind, how does the FMC account for the increased fuel usage we get when we lower the gear and flap during a normal approach and landing? 
The answer to that is, of course, it doesn't, ever. While the checklist specifies flap 20 for landing, it says nothing about the go-round. There is a tendency to automatically retract the flaps to five in a go-round with this failure. This is not specified by the checklist, as it is specified with the engine fail message, use flaps 20 for landing and flaps five for go-round, and in this case, is incorrect. The flaps remain at 20 for the go-round unless other performance considerations are required, such as being engine out. But since this is a Boeing and more than one thing can't go wrong at once, you'll be fine. A common question in the simulator is whether the five knots that we add to a normal VREF is added to the non-normal checklist VREFs, and the answer is yes. This includes any additives for steady gusting headwinds, as well as FCTM recommended additives for gusty crosswinds with auto throttle engaged for manual landings. With a slats drive failure at a heavy weight takeoff, continued flap retraction leads to a conflict between the flap limit speed and the minimum manoeuvre stick shaker speed. So let's see what this looks like. On a heavyweight takeoff with the slats drive malfunction, you're actually left with a really small margin between these two speeds prior to any flap retraction. As discussed, typically crew then choose to retract the flap. Seems to make sense. As soon as you do this, your minimum speed increases with flap retraction, but the flap limit speed does not. The aircraft is slow to accelerate as it tries to avoid an overspeed situation, often generating ICAS airspeed low during the acceleration. Eventually, the airspeed will settle down in excess of the flap limit speed to remain clear of the min manoeuvre speed. Deciding that this was a bad move and re-extending the flaps is even funny to watch from the instructor station, perhaps not so much for the pilot seat, because the flap limit speed is driven by the flap selection lever and pretty much instantly drops down straight away. Okay, so I've got a short video here in case the quality of the video inside the presentation turned into a video doesn't come out well, then you'll find the video on my YouTube channel and the Infinitim training videos folder. Let's have a look. So you can see the aircraft accelerating down the runway here. Uh, I've hidden the audio just to make it easier to watch. V1, rotate. Positive rate, gear up. In this case, the malfunction is scheduled to kick off when the pilot monitoring selects flap one. There's our acceleration segment scheduled. Thrust reduction results in a bit of a speed loss. The autopilot pitches down to accelerate. And we're on our way. So as we reach flap 5 minimum speed, we'll see flap 1 selected. And that's when the failure kicks in. OK, so at this point on the ICAS, we would have slats drive. As you can see, the margins become pretty tight. Around about now, there's an airspeed low generated on the ICAS, which eventually clears as the airspeed exceeds the minimum maneuver margin speed. However, since the flap one speed limit remains in place and the maneuver margin is right up against it, the airplane eventually settles a few knots into the flap limit speed in order to remain five knots above the maneuver margin speed and this is what we're left with. And further climb, several thousands of feet, exacerbate the situation.
Yeah, look, I can't explain why the autopilot flight director system Toga mode doesn't cope with the changed aerodynamic situation during a slats drive go round. But repeated exercises in the simulator have demonstrated that it just simply doesn't. The pitch attitude remains way too low to contain airspeed during the initial climb segment, and manual reversion is required every time. Remember, when I say manual reversion, I don't just mean fly manually and follow the flight directors, because in this instance, they'll be giving you a bum steer as well. You'll have to pitch up manually to an appropriate pitch attitude to contain your airspeed. Note that if you are engine out, the problem is less obvious because of reduced performance, but it's still there. As long as you expect it and deal with it, hey, you could even brief it, it's not a big deal. Still annoying though. Once again, a short video uh, which is available on the YouTube channel if you want the direct source. Here we are on approach Cat 3, Land 3, roll out and flare arm through 500 feet. We're in the middle of a slats drive failure and they failed as soon as the slats were extended, so we've got no or practically no slat extension at the moment and flap 20 selected. The speed is VREF 30 plus 30. There's the go around triggered. You'll notice there is a bit of a pitch response, but it's not much. The airspeed runs away pretty quickly. We're still descending. Finally, now we're climbing. And even though the rate of climb does get quite decent at 3,000 feet a minute, the speed is way running away. It's definitely not pitching to maintain VREF at all in the go round. And as the speed approaches the flat limit speeds, it pitches up a little bit more, but it's too late. And you end up with load relief and flap retraction from 20 to 5. And even more flap retraction as the flap limit is uh, speed is exceeded again. Basically a fairly inadequate response from the flight director. For an aircraft with excellent braking characteristics that tends to operate in and out of airports with 4,000 metre runways, an awful lot of time is spent working through the landing performance tables to verify non-normal landing distances of failures that generally have little impact on landing distance. And that's the end of that politically incorrect statement. As a basic operating principle, crew will always be required to check and ensure that sufficient landing distance is available during non-normal operations. However, this process should be a practical one. Looking for unusual circumstances such as short runways, high elevations, tailwinds, overweight landing, contaminated runway surfaces, etc. as compared with the landing distance available that might significantly impact on landing performance. A detailed calculation to the meter is usually overkill. In this specific failure instance, it can be seen that the increased braking distance comparing normal ops to slats drive max manual is approximately 10%. The increase in order brake landing distance for the failure should not be significantly different, which provides a meaningful indication of how much runway the aircraft is likely to use with a slats drive landing with order brake, as opposed to the minimum max manual braking landing distance that's required. Remember that all non-normal landing distances are max manual braking and some kind of factoring is required to ensure a margin during non-normal landings. Refer to your A1 and common sense for guidance. So the VREF speed selected by the checklist covers the worst case scenario of the slats fully retracted. As with most non-normals, the reference speed additive is based on the VREF 30 speed irrespective of the actual landing and flap selection. So in this case, even though you'll be landing flap 20, your VREF will be VREF 30 plus 30 knots. Landing flap is maintained in any subsequent go round as the checklist doesn't specify a go round flap setting. Note that if for some reason you're combining a slats drive malfunction and an engine out approach, it's clearly not your day, is it? Then the situation is different. We'll look at that in a second. The 20 slash bit of the scratch pad selection into the FMC approach reference page provides an item reference for the landing flap line in the ECL landing checklist, irrespective of whether the ECL is actually able to close loop the landing flap item. It also provides a reference figure for the bottom left of the PFD if your airline chose that option. Slats drive in combination with engine failure will result in a flap 20 approach and landing, but in the event of a go round, flap 5 may be required due to missed approach climb performance. 
crew should assess what is the most conservative response to the combination of failures that the manufacturer doesn't directly support. Remember, Boeing don't support the concept of two things going wrong at the same time. So let's just summarise what we've talked about. The takeoff scenario, particularly at heavy weight, is going to be quite tricky whether you choose to delay flap retraction or not. And really, I would consider delaying flap retraction until after the non normal checklist is complete. As discussed, with a heavy weight takeoff and a slat drive failure, when you do come to retract the flaps, if you choose to do so, you're going to come up against a fairly uncomfortable situation of the high and low speed limits bunching in on each other as you accelerate through that phase. There's really no way to avoid it. And finally, a slats drive go round becomes a manually flown exercise as the toga pitch mode seems unable to cope with the change in the wing. The airplane pitches too low, the speed gets away, you're going to have to go manual and pitch above the flight director bar in order to contain your airspeed, at least initially. That's the end of the presentation. I hope you've enjoyed it. We'll see you again soon.